All right, thanks everyone for joining today's webinar on palm biology and current West Coast issues. Uh, before we begin, I wanna let you all know if you weren't already aware that we recently changed our name from Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements to Rainbow Ecoscience. We did this simply to simplify our name and to better capture how we have evolved the way we serve and support custom, customers, companies, municipalities, and organizations like yours. And to do this without losing the legacy of our company from the past 25 years, we're excited about this change. And you'll see this reflected in all our areas of our company moving forward. So we want to start off with a safety brief. One of our core values at Rainbow EcoScience is of course safety. We begin, uh, we always complete a quick safety brief to remind ourselves of our safety protocols, please check your surroundings for any trip hazards, such as cords or bags. We have attendees from all over the country, so please be aware of any inclement weather in your area. If you are in a vehicle, please make sure you're parked in a safe location. My name is Robin Kim. I am the Southwest Territory Manager for Rainbow Ecoscience, uh, which includes California, Arizona, Nevada, and Hawaii. As a territory manager, my job is to provide training and education on plant health care protocols to plant health care professionals. I also provide technical and field support for any PHC related questions and can support you with any product and or equipment needs. My background is in agriculture and arboriculture. Uh, attended Cal Poly Pomona, got my BS in plant science, licensed pest control advisor, got my applicator's license. And I was, I was the director of Arbicare with a large pest control company down in Southern California. If there are any internet connection issues on our end, please sit tight and we'll get that fixed as soon as possible. If you have any questions during the webinar, please type that question into our Q&A box using your control panel. We'll answer them at the end of the uh, presentation. We are recording this webinar and it will be available afterwards. You'll receive an email with the link to view it. Finally, this webinar is worth one ISA CU. If you did not enter or don't remember if you entered your ISA certification number in during the registration, you can type that into the Q&A box right now and we'll make sure you get your CUs. Okay. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Don Hodel. A little bit about Mr. Hodel. He was an Emeritus Landscape Horticulture Advisor for the University of California, Cooperative Extension in Los Angeles County, a position he held for 36 years until his retirement in 2019. He is a graduate of Cal Poly Pomona and the University of Hawaii. He specialized in the selection and management of woody plants, including palms, and developed applied research projects and educational programs to advance and share research-based information with the commercial landscape industries. He has authored over 650 publications, including eight books and over hundred peer reviewed publications about various aspects of woody landscape plant management. I'd like to thank Mr. Hodel for speaking today. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Robin. I'm going to do the screen share now. So hopefully this, this goes through with no problems. And OK. All right. Now I just got to do one more thing, and we're good to go. OK. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I knew Rob, I've known Robin for I think a year or two now. He uh, contacted me about a new pest he had found on Ficus microcarpa. Uh, I think it was over a year ago. And it turns out it's a, it's a moth and it eats the foliage as if Ficus microcarpa doesn't need any more new pests. And he and I and some other people wrote a, a, a nice article about it in uh, Palm Arbor, and I'll tell you about Palm Arbor in a minute. 
So that was a good introduction, Robin. Thank you. I don't think I have anything to add. I can't embellish it any more than, than you've already done. So <laughs> we'll uh, uh, start. Uh, before we get into the, today's topic, I want to bring your attention to a book I wrote uh, almost 10 years ago now, The Biology and Management of Landscape Palms. And uh, th this, this book uh, was published by the ISA Western Chapter the Britain Fund, to be exact. And uh, uh, it's uh, 180 pages, 11 chapters, has a glossary and index, and has over 400 uh, color photographs in it. So it's all about palm biology, which I'll summarize in today's presentation, and uh, how to manage these palms in the landscape, everything from pests and diseases to to uh, pruning, transplanting, and abiotic disorders. And I'm not promoting this because I'm making any money off it. In fact, I don't get one thin dime from any of, any of the sales of this uh, publication, this book. Uh, all, the, all the money goes back into the Britain Fund, which supports additional research in arboriculture. So that's a, it's, a, um, it's a good re reference for you if you're really, if you're into palms. <laughs> Also, there's some free stuff available to you. And of course, many people, uh, when they hear it's free, they aren't interested at all in it. But anyway, I have a website which where I posted some of my publications. I, I don't keep it up to date as much as I should. However, there's one part of that website, which is an electronic journal called Palm Arbor, which is in its seventh year now. And there are often I mean, it's full of articles about palms and trees covering a wide variety of topics from, from nomenclature, taxonomy, pests and disease management. And uh, you can just find Palm Arbor and um, my other some other publications of mine, just go to those websites, they're, they're there, or you can just Google Hodel Palms and Trees, and it'll take you right to it. So I'm gonna start out talking about uh, the biology of palms and how it impacts their management in the landscape. So a good place to start is to answer the question, what is a palm? Because there are some plants out in the landscape that are masquerading as palms. They they're even uh, have palm in their common common name. But uh, palms are, are monocots. And if you remember back to high school or college uh, biology, there are two great classifications of flowering plants, the dicots and the monocots. And in recent years with the advent of uh, DNA technology, there's been sort of a reshuffling and, and realignment of that, but generally we have um, um, monocots and dicots. And, and uh, palms are woody mon monocots. They do make wood, although, although they do it in a different way or manner than uh, some of our traditional dicot trees do. Their, their habit, the either solitary or clustered habit, depending on how many stems or trunks they have naturally. Uh, photosynthetic and reproductive efforts are aggregated into relatively few organs. So we have leaves that photosynthesize to produce sugars for, for growth. And we have inflorescences, which are clusters of flowers that produce fruits and seeds. And the amazing thing about that is because a, a palm tree has relatively few leaves and inflorescences, this impacts the potential for litter in the landscape with a few timely cuts on an annual basis, all a year's worth of potential leaf litter and flower or fruit litter can be collected before it lands in the landscape. Uh, palms have an adventitious root system and uh, the roots are each root, each primary root at least, arises independently from other roots 
from an area at the base of the trunk called the root initiation zone. And we'll be looking uh, more carefully at, at each of these features in a bit. Uh, palms have no mechanism for secondary growth. All growth in palms is primary. There's no cambium that, that lays down uh, uh, phloem on the outside and xylem on the inside, which enables uh, stems or trunks of, uh, of other plants to enlarge in girth as they get older. Uh, palms don't have that ability. Once the uh, palm trunk has formed and it elongates vertically, it doesn't increase in girth with age. So that raises an inter interesting question is what about wounds? How do wounds cover over on palm trunks? Well, they don't. So that's another aspect of their landscape management in which we have to be very careful. We don't want to wound palm, palm trunks because the, the, the injuries are there forever. And there's only one apical meristem in palms. That's at the top of the trunk. Each trunk has one, typically. Now, uh, if it's a if it's a multi-stemmed or clustered palm, that means there are multiple uh, trunks or stems, and each one of those stems would have one apical meristem. So, if that one stem was was damaged or destroyed, the entire clump would tend to live on because other stems can take over the growth. But if it's a, if it's a solitary trunked palm, then if that apical meristem is, is damaged or destroyed, it could spell trouble for the palm, serious trouble, even death of the palm. Uh, the vascular bundles in, in uh, palm trunks, because again, there's no vascular cambium, the vascular bundles are scattered throughout the palm stem. Again, there, there's no phloem on the outside and xylem on the inside of the stem. They're scattered throughout the stem. Uh, most active growth is during the warm months because palms are basically uh, subtropical or tropical. In fact, uh, their intolerance of cold is what limits where we can grow palms. And uh, palms are not sago palms, which are cycads, or ponytail palms like Molinas or Bricarnias or other palm-like plants like Dracaenas or Yuccas. Yes, they have a palm-like habit, but they are, are not palms. And then another interesting feature of palms, which we don't often associate with palms, at least the general public, and that is they're often armed. So they have thorns or spines. And those of you who have worked carefully in, in, a, in, a, in a Phoenix palm or a, even a Washingtonia, you've probably encountered these spines or thorns, much to your uh, chagrin, because they've probably ripped your skin and, and punctured your skin. But uh, here's looking at, uh, on the left, Canary Island date palm, one of the iconic palms in Southern California. And that's an example of a solitary stem palm with just one trunk. And over on the right is an American native native palm. That's a Coelurafe ridei, the Everglades palm. And, and that, that plant is there in Balboa Park in front of the botanical building. And it has multiple stems. It's a clustered uh, palm. Looking at vascular bundles in a palm trunk, this is Washingtonia robusta, the Mexican fan palm. Uh, each one of those black little, or not black, but dark brown dots represents a vascular bundle, which has xylem and phloem in it. And uh, uh, notice that, that the, the vascular bundles become more densely arranged toward the periphery of the palm stem. So on the left side of the, of the uh, photograph is the center of the trunk. And you see that there's a great, great distance between the vascular bundles. And as you move to the right toward the periphery, the vascular bundles become very densely arranged. And this is a phenomenon that increases the, the strength, the inherent strength of palm stems and trunks. So yes, they, can't, they cannot increase their girth to increase their strength as they get taller and older, but they have, they have the ability 
to uh, withstand incredible wind forces because those vascular bundles can be likened to rebar and the palm trunk can be likened to a reinforced concrete column with the, the rebar or vascular bundles embedded in a matrix of uh, thick walled parenchyma cells. In fact, uh, palms are remarkable in, in, in the plant kingdom because their cell, their, their, their trunk tissues, cell walls actually increase with strength as they get older. I wish I could say the same for myself that I was getting stronger as I get older, but sadly that's not the case. <laughs> Looking at the palm uh, apical meristem, here I've, I've longitudinally sliced through a king palm, our Contaphenus Cunningham Niana. And you, and you see it on the left and on the right, you see a close up. And you can see the top of that stem is sort of a U shaped feature. And then right in the center of that is the apical meristem. That's where all the growth in this palm is taking, above ground growth at least, is taking place. That's all primary growth. And those uh, vertically arranged uh, sort of uh, la layers, one, on, one next to another, those are the leaf bases with the older leaves on the outside and the developing leaves on the inside. Now, if you've, if you've ever eaten hearts of palm salad and you like it, which I do, you're basically eating the apical meristem of a palm. Now, uh, back, back in the old days, they used to extract palms from the wild to get at the apical meristem. Uh, and they, then they realized, oh, well, we're, killing all our palms, we're decimating the palms. So now they've actually planted plantations of palms to harvest the apical meristem. And I, I love eating uh, apical meristem of palms, but I only, I, I make, I check the origin to make sure they're, they're plantation grown. Delicious uh, uh, when, when they're marinated in vinaigrette, absolutely uh, spectacular food. And um, getting back to if that apical meristem is, is severe, severely damaged or if it's destroyed, that, that, that means that palm trunk is dead. And again, if it's a single trunk palm, that means the, that palm is a goner. And you would think, well, why, does, why did a plant evolve that its, its existence was so precarious and dependent on the survivability of that little piece of triangular tissue. It's just to fill a few fraction of an inch in size. And, and actually because it's embedded deep down inside those uh, leaf bases, it's pretty well protected from uh, trauma, disease, pests, and fire. In fact, uh, palm trunks uh, during, during fires when Washingtonias, uh, Mexican fan palms go up in flames, they'll actually survive that because the apical meristem survives because it's protected inside those, a series of overlapping leaf bases. And even though the, the leaf blades will burn off, the apical meristem still survives. So if we look at general palm architecture, it's a single elongated axis, and that's the stem or the trunk, or a series of axes. So a series of stems or trunks, if it's a, if it's a multi-stemmed or clustered species. Growth is restricted to the extremities, meaning leaves and inflorescences at the top and roots at the bottom. Along the length of that trunk, there's basically nothing going on because it's not increasing in diameter because there's no vascular cambium. The roots are adventitious and they arise from the root initiation zone. So here's a, a, a photo of a date palm. This is a Phoenix dactylifera, the edible date. This is the Halawi variety and it's out in desert center about halfway to, uh, off of, on Interstate 10, about halfway to the Arizona border. And the reason this palm was uh, removed from the, from the grow was uh, uh, W.D. Young and Sons. Uh, I was working with Dwayne Young. 
and my colleagues, Dennis Pittenger and Jim Downer, on a palm leaf removal study during transplanting. And so they had, they had dug up these palms, carried them over, over a short distance away, laid them down, and then we did all sorts of leaf tie up and removal combinations on them. And then they were replanted to see how uh, leaf removal and tie up affected their uh, transplant success. But this is a great picture to show what's going on with a palm. And here it is in all its naked, unabashed glory. You see the leaves and fruit clusters coming out the top and the roots at the bottom. And there's basically nothing going on in that trunk, along, along that trunk, other than water being taken up and uh, carbohydrates going down to the roots. Uh, the palm leaf has three three parts to it, and here's a wind a, a blown down uh, Mexican fan palm leaf. Came down during a windstorm, and it serves the the function of uh, illustrating the three parts to it. We have the base, which is which is always tubular when it's first developed in the apical meristem, but then with age, it splits opposite the petiole and and remains tubular only only what right at its, at its base. Then the uh, petiole, which uh, is the organ that attaches the leaf blade to the base. And then out at the end is the blade and the blade is, is the solar receptor. That's what's collecting all the sunlight going through the process of photosynthesis synthesis and making carbohydrates or sugars and sending them down to, to the uh, trunk and the roots. There are two basic types of palm leaf blades in the, in the palm family. They're pinnate or feather leaves, as you see in this king palm, or uh, fan or palmate leaves, as you see on this dwarf palmetto palm. And, and it all depends on, on how the leaf segments are arranged. You, you see in the feather or pinnate leaf, there's a long leaf blade axis and the segments are arranged along that, that, that axis, which is called a leaf rachis. Whereas in the uh, palmate leaves, the, the leaf blade segments tend to originate toward a central point, like the fingers on your hand, hence the uh, name palmate. Uh, in terms of inflorescences, they're often showy and conspicuous. This is the Mexican blue fan palm. And in, in this case, it, it, it's not at all shy about showing off its reproductive efforts. Uh, these are uh, flower stalks that have thousands of individual flowers on them, and they, they're projected way beyond the leaves. So it's, it's an extremely showy palm when it's in flower. Uh, palm roots are adventitious, and this is a king palm or contaphoenix, and you can see the, the root the root mat here being formed by these adventitious roots originating from the base of the trunk. Each root arises independently from other roots. A, a summary of the palm family, about 200 genera, and, and a, a genus, singular, is a collection of similar species. So there are 200 genera in the palm family, about 2,500 species. They're mostly wet tropical. Some are from moist or monsoonal tropical climates where uh, there's a distinct wet and dry period. There are a few subtropical or even temperate species. And some of these come from harsh climates, including deserts. And the last two categories, subtropical and temperate and harsh climates, deserts, uh, these are the kind of palms that we can grow best in Southern California and on the uh, West Coast. And, and the, the family, because it's, it, it's basically a tropical or subtropical family, there's this distinct lack of, cold, lack of cold tolerance across the family. Yes, we can grow a few palms in temperate areas, and there are a few palms that will tolerate uh, zero degrees Fahrenheit but uh, those are exceptions. And generally the palm family is, is uh, 
cold intolerant. And if you want to impress your significant other or anyone else, uh, here are a few anomalies that you can casually share at a cocktail party, uh, if we even have any more of those again. But the oil palm and coconut palm are two of the world's top 10 agronomic crops. Imagining just mentioning that right off the cuff as you're sipping a martini and how many people you'll impress with that little nugget of knowledge. Uh, their palms have many record holders in the plant kingdom. So the tallest monocot is a species of Ceroxylon, which grows in the Andes Mountains in South America. They grow to 200 feet tall. The longest stems in the uh, uh, plant, plant uh, kingdom is a species of rotan, which is a climbing vining palm. And they make rattan furniture from the stems. One was measured at 550 feet in length, which is way longer than the tallest redwood. Uh, the largest inflorescences or clusters of flowers belongs to a palm called Carifa, a big fan palm from Asia. And that inflorescence can be 30 feet tall and 15 feet wide and have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of flowers in it. The longest leaf is a species of raphia from Africa, raphia regalis. The leaf leaves can be up to 80 feet long. That's one leaf. And of course, the largest seed in the plant kingdom is the famous Lodicea or double coconut from the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean, which uh, can be, whoa, gosh, um, as big as a basketball and they're, they're bilobed. So you can mention some of these uh, anomalies about palms and it'll gain you a lot of social traction, I'm sure. Okay, let's look at the two uh, conditions that have uh, reared their uh, ugly heads here on the West Coast, especially in Southern California. And the first one is Fusarium wilt of queen and Mexican fan palm. And here, here you see uh, at kind of ground center, uh, ground zero, I mean, where we first found this disease down in Fallbrook in a, in a private uh, landscape and you see queen palms dying left and right here. So I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the Fusarium wilt disease of Canary Island date palm that we already have. And it's been around for over 50 years in Southern California. So it's a vascular disease. It, it, once it gets into the palm, it attacks those vascular bundles and reduces their ability to move water around. And so the plant basically wilts and dies. Typically fusarium wilt of Canary Island date palm is species specific. They have species specific forms. So the, the form that attacks uh, Phoenix canariensis doesn't attack other kinds of palms, even other, other Phoenix palms. It's primarily spread on pruning tools. It's 100% fatal, but it's nearly 100% preventable through safe pruning practices. So you, you've probably seen this. Here's Phoenix canariensis just uh, west of downtown Los Angeles. And this is what you typically see in a, in a mass planting. Uh, many palms in various stages of decline, ha having, having a, a few green leaves at the top with a lot of dead leaves down below. And um, you, you know that this is Fusarium wheel. You don't even have to have it checked by the lab. This, is, this, the, this symptomology is so diagnostic for a Fusarium wheel of Canary Island date palm that um, there's no sense in going to a lab. You just, you know, it's, it's that. And you know the vector is we. People are the vectors of this disease, spreading it on pruning tools as they move from one palm to the other. So uh, for 50 years, as I said, we've been wrestling with Fusarium wilt of Canary Island date palms here in Southern California. It's caused by the species of Fusarium oxysporum, 
Fusarium oxysporum, and then it has one of these forms, Forma specialis canariensis, meaning it attacks canary island date palm. So, so in June, uh, nearly three years ago, two and a half years ago, I received a call about declining queen palms in Fallbrook. So I visited these palms and took uh, uh, leaf samples and um, took them to Paul Santos at Waypoint Analytical in Anaheim. And Paul's a great plant pathologist and plant diag diagnostician. And he isolated Fusarium oxysporum out of it, which by itself isn't too, too concerning because uh, Fusarium oxysporum is everywhere. What's, what's critical is what is if, if it is if it was the Forma specialis canariensis. That's what we wanted to know. So um, we, we had a hard time getting it out of petioles and leaves. So I had to go back a second time to this Fallbrook site and we actually cut down a palm and sliced and diced the trunk. And uh, voila, we got, Fusarium oxysporum form a specialis palmarum out of it. And that, that was uh, the first documented or confirmed case of this new fusarium wilt of queen palms and Mexican fan palms in Southern California. However, I think it's been lurking here for several years and we just happen to be the, the first ones to, uh, to confirm it. Uh, Paul and I had, had been noticing Mexican fan palms declining for several years. And in, 19, in, in, in 2020, Paul isolated Fusarium oxysporum from Mexican fan palms in West LA in the Playa Vista region. CDFA confirmed that it too was Fusarium oxysporum form of specialis palmarum. So now we have it's full blown now, this uh, new fusarium wilt disease that's here in Southern California, attacking queens and Mexican fan, the Mexican fan palms. And by the way, in Florida, where we think the disease came from, it probably came in on nursery stock, palms being brought in from Florida. In Florida, it attacks, also attacks Canary Island date palm. So now Canary Island date palm has two different fusarium diseases that that can attack it. So here it is on, on Washingtonia and Playa Vista in, in West Los Angeles. I'm not a Washingtonia. Yeah, Washingtonia, Mexican fan palm. I'm 70 years old, so please, please excuse me if I make a few verbal mistakes here. I'm, I'm always seem to be doing that nowadays. And I know I, I, heard, I saw Leonard Markowitz, he's a, a, a colleague of mine from our Cal Poly days. I think he's attending today's meeting. He made a remark about how, how good I look. Uh, Leonard and I were well, lived in the same dorm at Cal Poly in the early 70s, a half century ago, can you believe it? But Leonard, I want you to know, I might look young, but I feel like I'm 100 years old most of the time. So here's some more shots of fusarium, uh, the, the new fusarium on Washingtonia. This is also in West LA and there on the left, left photo, you see Paul Santos up on a bucket lift going up to collect the uh, leaves. You notice that the symptoms are in the older leaves first. Uh, on the left is Laguna Niguel, you see it. And on the right, you see it in West LA again. Here it is in Riverside at the Tyler Mall, just off the 91 freeway. And you, you, the, the photo on the right, you can see the, the uh, dead, nearly dead palm, actually has a little bit green left in it, the nearly dead palm, three palms down, but the, uh, the two palms this side of it are starting to get older leaves with uh, symptoms. So it's, it's spreading. So let's look at the symptoms and diagnosis of this new, new fusarium wilt. It's similar to the fusarium wilt on Canary Island date palm in that it attacks the water conducting tissue, which leads to leaf desiccation and uh, wilting. 
Initial symptoms are on the lower or older leaves. In, in queen palms, there's one-sided leaf yellowing and browning. So if you look longitudinally at a, at a queen palm leaf, one side would remain green and the other side would turn yellow or brown. In Mexican fan palms, we typically have wedge-shaped sections of the leaf blade that turn yellow or brown. Now, now both of these symptoms, one-sided yellowing and browning or wedge-shaped yellowing and browning can be the cause by other um, agents. For example, uh, there's a, in, in queen, in, in the pinnate leaf palms, if you saw one-sided leaf yellowing or browning on a canary island date palm, I wouldn't immediately say it's fusarium if it was just one or two leaves in the canopy. If there were a lot of leaves in the canopy, then it's probably fusarium will. But one or two leaves can probably be a, a, a minor nuisance disease called dothariella, which uh, really isn't anything to be concerned about. Uh, in Mexican fan palms, you can get wedge shape or yellow, yellowing and browning from various petiole diseases, relatively minor diseases, not, not, not fusarium. But if you see a lot of leaves like that, and, and the palm is dying, you know it's probably fusarium. So here's a, a queen palm leaf that's a little bit past its prime, but you can see how, how the uh, lower side, that side of the leaf retained its green, in this case, yellow color longer, and the, the, the upper side uh, was affected first. In, in fan palms, you see these wedge-shaped areas of chlorotic and necrotic tissue. And, and again, if it's just one leaf in the canopy that has this, it's probably not fusarium will. It is probably one of these minor diseases. But if there are many leaves in the canopy and, and most of the leaves are dying now, it's probably fusarium will. So here's some uh, close-ups of how this streaking occurs. You see it along the petiole on the left and on the right and extending into the uh, leaf blade. Again, if just one leaf like this, it, it might not be fusarium will. Usually, usually typically a, a palm that has fusarium will will have multiple leaves in it that have these characters. So petioles typically have reddish brown or dark brown streaking. Leaf symptoms, although, although they start in the older or old, older or lower leaves, they tend with time to work their way up toward the center. Uh, cross sections of trunk typically will display dramatic dark brown to nearly black discoloration. And the, these areas of discoloration are toward the periphery of, of the trunk. And there's often a pink or pink orange blush associated uh, with it. And we, we found in terms of laboratory diagnosis that, that the trunk tissues were the best place to, to, to get samples for isolation of the fusarium. You almost always, it always got it out of the trunk tissues. So here's a, a queen palm. This is down in Fallbrook. And you see the uh, dark brown tissues surrounding the, on the outer layer of the trunk surrounding the central cylinder. And over on the right, you see an area of, of the dark brown tissue with, with in, the, in the area on the inside of it, perhaps where the infection is advancing, has kind of an orange or pinkish orange blush to it. And in Mexican fans, it's very similar. Again, you see the extensive areas of dark brown uh, tissue to the periphery of the stem. And on the right, you see a close up of one of the, the uh, areas where it's advancing and you see that there's a kind of an orangish uh, blush to it. Kind of an orange circle actually around that area. Uh, in, in, in my experience, symptoms alone are typically sufficient for identification. Uh, infected palms will have an inordinate quantity 
of yellowing, browning, and dead leaves in the lower canopy, or if the palms in an intensely managed landscape where dead leaves are quickly removed, the palm will have a perpetually small canopy because as soon as a, a, a lower leaf dies, it's taken off. So if, if you're looking at, at, at a palm that's in a intensely managed landscape and, and the canopies are always small, there's a good chance that uh, it, fusarium wilt is there. In the new fusarium wilt, death is pretty rapid in a few months. In fact, the leaves die so rapidly that they, they tend to retain their natural shape. Whereas in the original fusarium of Canary Island date palm, uh, the, the, the leaves, the, the palm can live sometime for a year or two, especially if it's close to the coast where it's cool and humid and there's not that much water stress on the plant. Uh, I, I've seen Canary Island date palms live for, for several years with fusarium wilt. And in that case, the leaves do tend to wilt. They become kind of um, uh, flat against a the trunk. They don't retain their natural shape. Uh, so he, here's some queens. This was in West LA that my colleague Jim Downer and I went to look at 10 years ago. And uh, we, I'm convinced this is the fusarium wilt of, of uh, queen palm and Mexican fan palm. We actually got fusarium oxysporum out of it, but, but we never did the DNA analysis, the PCR to determine if it was Formis bicialis palmarum. But you can see that the palms to the left of it are starting to get symptomatic leaves. And no, note how the leaves haven't collapsed. They've retained their natural shape. So this is uh, evidence to me that this disease has probably been present here and kind of lurking under the radar for several years. Another one in Long Beach. Again, the leaves have kind of retained their natural uh, shape. So how do we manage this fusarium wilt? Well, it, it's 100% fatal and there's no cure. Can we exclude it? we can probably exclude fusarium wilt of canary island date palm. But this new fusarium wilt, according to researchers in Florida, they felt it could be spread through the air by wind and rain and maybe by birds, which if true is a game changer, because if that's the case, we will not be able to exclude it here in here in your in the landscape because there'll be these natural uh, vectors spreading it around exclusion and sanitation so um, you know if we okay so if we we get rid of a, a disease palm in our landscape what about disease palms that are that are in adjacent landscapes if, if it's wind and and rain and maybe birds they can spread it into our landscape again. So um, I, I don't know if it's been proven that, that it can spread by wind and rain, but the Florida researchers think so. I mean, here in Southern California, <laughs> we've had people claiming for years that wind and rain and birds spread fusarium wilt of Canary Island date palm, but, but no one's ever documented that. No one's ever confirmed that. And of course, you, of course many people want to blame it on, on uh, sources other than themselves because they didn't want to be held responsible for blaming, for, for, being, for, for spreading it on pruning tools. So uh, wind and rain and uh, birds were uh, likely culprits here. But we, we've proven that it spreads on pruning tools, but we've never been able to prove it spread by wind or rain. But if that's true for this new one, it's a game changer. Disinfect all tools between prior uh, work on each tree. Uh, you know, in a high-end landscape, uh, I, I, I know in some landscapes where they have one saw dedicated to one tree and it's not allowed, allowed to be used on any other, other palm, just that one palm. Uh, no chainsaws. Unfortunately, uh, you know, chainsaws make our work so much easier 
but it's nearly impossible to clean thoroughly, disinfect thoroughly a chainsaw. So uh, I, I, I tell arborists, yeah, avoid using a chainsaw if you can, because you, you really can't disinfect it thoroughly because it has so many gears and moving parts and stuff. All you need is one little particle of sawdust that's infected and you can you can spread it to another palm. Now uh, Jim and I were working on a, a method to heat treat chainsaws. We had we had a big metal box and we put a chainsaw in it with a couple of uh, little burners and we heat it up to uh, 206, 70 or 80 degrees. Oh well, no, excuse me, 180, 190 degrees for 30 minutes. And we think that would be sufficient to disin disinfect that chainsaw. So actually you're, you're sort of pasteurizing it, although you aren't using moist heat, you're using dry heat. But with that, that method needs more work. And uh, perhaps we can work on that again someday. Uh, limit pruning to dead or dying leaves. I, I know you want to take off green leaves and your customer wants you to take off more leaves so you don't have to come back as often. But uh, explain, explain to, your, to your customer why you don't want to use a chainsaw, why you don't want to remove green leaves, because it increases the risk of spreading this fatal disease. And yes, you have to, you, you have to charge more because you're not using a chainsaw and you, and you are coming back more often. But explain to them the reason why. And if they don't care, they say, I don't care, I use a chainsaw. I want green leaves removed hey, you've given them fair warning and if they still want to do it, well, then it's up to you to decide if, if you want to have them as a client. Avoid soil and water movement from infected to healthy palms because uh, we've also found, at least in Fusarium wheel of Canary Island date palm, that, that water running from an infected palm to a healthy palm can spread the disease because once it enters the leaves and progresses down through the vascular, system into the roots, it's then down in the soil. Remove infected palms promptly with as little spread of soil and plant parts as possible. Um, this means ideally making one cut at the base. <laughs> Actually, it, ideally it means making lifting the whole palm out in one piece, root ball and canopy and trunk. And, and wrapping it up in six mil poly and taking it to a landfill. Although that's probably impractical in many cases, but if you have to cut and grind, keep it to a minimum, spread six mil poly out on the ground to collect the, uh, the, the sawdust and, and bits of, of, of trunk tissue from grinding and cutting and put up plywood barriers to keep this stuff contained because we found that when we cut a palm leaf and we collected sawdust drifting 100 feet away on a peepee -pee dish, we, we could get fusarium spread that way. We, we actually did that in uh, uh, San Clemente on an infected date, Canary Island date palm and got sawdust drifting 100 feet away on a Petri dish and we got fusarium out of it. Uh, replace a palm that died from fusarium wilt with one that is resistant to the disease. If you replant at the same spot with another Canary Island date palm or a queen palm or a Mexican fan palm, uh, the, the chances are very high that there's a particles of roots remaining in the soil that have the fusarium in it and they will reinfect a newly planted palm. In fact, we found at our field station in Irvine where we did some work on, on Fusarium wilt of Canary Island date palm, that the fungus can survive in root particles in the soil for at least 25 years and then infect a newly planted susceptible palm. So um, now I know, I know some places they've uh, excavated a lot of soil They've done 10 by 10 by 10 foot deep pits, lined it with six milli poly in an attempt to keep out or exclude potentially diseased uh, root particles. And um, 
this this gave them a few additional years, but eventually the disease worked its way through the poly, over the poly or through the seams in it and infected the palm. So it, it's not foolproof, that method, but it, it does give you a few more years. Some uh, uh, re replacement species that so far are not uh, susceptible to either of the fusarium wilt diseases include the Chilean wine palm, Jubea chilensis, which has the fattest trunk of any palm uh, we, can, we can grow in Southern California. Wild date palm, by the way, it can be grown clear up into the Bay Area. Uh, wild date palm, king palm, kentia palm, Mexican blue palms, Guadalupe palms. Uh, brahias are great palms for us. They, don't, they seem to be uh, resistant to diseases so far. And they're kind of, they're once established, they're drought tolerant, at least in the coastal plain. Bismarcky and Obilis, and then Washingtonia filifera, our native California fan palm. Uh, I don't recommend planting filifera into California fan palm in coastal areas because it's susceptible to pink rot and diamond scale diseases. But in inland areas, say in the uh, San Fernando, uh, San Gabriel Valleys, and of course the desert areas, this palm is, is okay there. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, all these palms <clears throat> may be susceptible to the banana moth, which I will be talking about in just a little bit. And uh, it's like we can't get away from diseases and pests now with palms. So here's a, here's a, a, a summary of the comparison of the two fusarium wilt diseases. Uh, and I've, I've put in bold the characters that are, are different between them. And starting at the top, of course, the pathogen is different, the form of the pathogen. In one, it's uh, Formus specialis palmarum, and the other one, it's Formus specialis canariensis. And then the death rate is typically quick in, in the new fusarium wilt, and it's quick to slow in the Canary Island date palm. Again, if, you're, if the palm is closer to the coast, it'll probably live longer simply because there's not as much water stress on it. If it's in, it's in hot, dry interior areas, the, the death is often uh, uh, quicker. The hosts are different. Uh, the new one attacks queen palm and Mexican fan palm and Canary Island date palm. And mule palm, which is a hybrid. Uh, you, I, only collectors have that in the landscape here. It's a hybrid between uh, Budia, the pindo palm, and queen palm. And then the, orig the original Fusarium wheel Canary Island date palm is, is only on Canary Island date palm so far. Um, the range of these two diseases is different. The uh, new ones in Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California. And the original one is only in Florida and California so far. Transmission is probably the most important one. <laughs> and uh, according to Florida researchers, wind and perhaps birds and insects can also move this disease around as well as tools and soil and water movement. As far as the original fusarium on Canary Island date palms, we only know that it's spread by tools, soil and water movement. So this impacts uh, exclusion. Is it possible to exclude the new one from the landscape? Probably no, because if it's around and it's spread by wind or birds, it's, it's gonna get in. So those are the major differences between uh, the diseases. I, and I might add that, that I suspect that some of the Canary Island date palms that have been going down from Fusarium wilt of Canary Island date palm might be going down from the new Fusarium wilt disease. So I, I, I know a few of these I've seen where, where they died so rapidly that the leaves retained their shape, which makes me think it, it was this new Fusarium wilt that killed them. But at the time, I just chalked it up to the original uh, canary, the Fusarium wilt. All right, let's, let's uh, finish up with uh, banana moth. Um, you are probably all aware of the South American palm weevil. 
which has been decimating Canary Island date palms and now other species of palms in San Diego for about, oh gosh, six or seven years now. And it's been well documented. And uh, I, I have an article about it in uh, Palm Arbor from 2016. And um, my colleague of mine, Mark Hoddle at UC Riverside is leading the uh, charge on this. And you may have seen his fantastic presentations on, uh, on the South American palm weevil and the damage they're doing to Canary Island date palms in San Diego County. Uh, unfortunately, however, um, we have our own version of the South American palm weevil up in LA and Orange counties farther to the north, and that is this banana moth. It's killing palms here like the South American palm weevil is killing Canary Island date palms in San Diego. Only it's not killing Canary Island date palms here farther north, it's killing kings and Kentias and Majesty Palms. On a scale that's equivalent to what's going on down in San Diego with, this, with the uh, South American palm weevil. So uh, here you see King Palms on the left in the center and Kentia Palm on the right, which are uh, going down from banana moth. Uh, the, but, Latin name of the banana moth is Opogona sakari. It has a wide host range, including palms and many non-palms, banana being one of them, as you can tell from the common name. So this is, impacts how we might manage this, this pest. We may have to check companion plants in the landscape to make sure they're not alternate hosts of this uh, pest for palms. It's native to subtropical and tropical Africa, but it's now widespread in Central America, Europe, Madagascar, and many Pacific Islands. In the United States, it's in Florida, California, and Hawaii now. Uh, in, in California, until recently, I had mostly documented it on uh, Majesty Palm, Ravenia, Ravenia rivularis, and windmill palm, Trachycarpus fortunii, and, and mostly in San Diego, surprisingly. Um, for many years, though, I had noticed Kentia palms and King, and more, even more recently, King palms was something ailing them. And because it was the new growth, where the newer leaves were, I kind of just chalked it up to uh, a disease like pink rot or an abi abiotic disorder like micronutrient deficiencies because those typically attack the, the newest leaves. And, and I think banana moth, at least on other species of palms other than majesty or windmill palms was kind of flying under the radar up here. And uh, it wasn't until a, a, a friend and colleague of mine, an, an extraordinary arborist, Ken Greeby, who works for uh, Arbor Pro in based in Yorba Linda. Uh, he, he's, he goes all over. He's uh, now in Hawaii doing tree inventories and tree assessments, but he, he works in Florida, uh, Washington, California, uh, Texas, uh, Kentucky. He goes all over the place. He's He's, he's an incredible ar arborist and, and knows so many different kinds of trees. And he said to me a couple of years ago, he goes, Don, there's something going on with king palms in Southeast LA County. And I said, yeah, I know I've seen that. And he said, but this is serious, Don. This is, this is something that's, that's not just an isolated incident. He said, it's really widespread. And um, so I, I went and looked and I thought, yeah, it is. Uh, it's more than I thought. And it, it, I saw it on Kentia palms too. And um, I, I decided that I would look into it because Ken urged me to. 
So here, here's what you see with the uh, banana moth. On the left is uh, Ravinia rivularis, a majesty palm. Those are in San Diego. Those, those are about 10, 12 years ago. And over on the right, you see Kentias in uh, West LA near Beverly Hills in um, oh, 2015, 2016. And, and what to take away from these two photos is how the uh, initial damage is on the newest leaves. And there, there you see a close up of the canopy of the Majesty Palm on the left with the new foliage coming out distorted and brown. And on the, on the right, you see a windmill palm in a, in a water use study that we had at our field station in Irvine oh, probably 12 or 15 years ago. And uh, we, these, these palm, this palm started declining and we dissected it and we found banana moth in it. Because the symptoms are primarily on new growth, at least initially, banana moth could be mistaken for other ailments like pink rock, pink rot disease and micronutrient deficiencies. It's not to say that, that those ailments couldn't also be involved uh, especially pink rot, because that that disease is very opportunistic. It is attracted to wounded palms and stress palms. So banana moth can wound the palm and then pink rot could get going. But generally, I think, at least with my, in my case, uh, banana moth was flying under the radar for some time and I was and I was attributing its symptoms to other problems. But uh, there's Ken next to uh, these king palms. He, we went down to the city of, of Orange and along Tustin Avenue there, almost they had planted king palms and street trees and almost every palm was moderately to severely affected. And on the right, you see it on king palms in Fullerton, California, also in Orange County. <clears throat> So um, I, with the help of West Coast Arborists, we took down some of these kings in, on Tustin Avenue in Orange, dissected them, took them to Paul Santos at Waypoint Analytic, Analytical, and we found banana moth in them. The adult moths are small, uh, only about a half to three quarters of an inch long, and the female legs, lay eggs at the base of the leaves uh, uh, they hatch in about 12 days, roughly at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. They're faster in warmer areas. And the larvae tunnel in, into the leaf tissue headed for the apical meristem. They know what's good for them, don't they? The larval development usually takes about 50 days and the pupil stage is about 20 days. Uh, thanks to Lyle, bus at the University of Florida for this image of an adult banana moth. Uh, the larvae are about three quarters to an inch and a quarter long. They're dirty white and somewhat transparent. They have very small legs and a dark head. The adult moths are not strong flyers. However, they're attracted to wounds like freshly cut petioles or leaf bases and especially on stressed palms. So these wounds give off a chemical signal that often attracts insects, and in this case, the banana moth. It's the same way with the South American palm weevil. Uh, cut petioles often, uh, they, they, they emit this chemical signal and it, it, bring, it actually attracts the adults to the palm. So there uh, on the left, you see a real good photo from Lyle at the University of Florida of a banana moth larva. And on the right, you see one from that windmill palm at our field station in Irvine that we extracted. And you also notice all the frass there, sawdust like frass. So banana moths are typically voracious eaters. The larvae are voracious eaters. Uh, 
of stressed, decaying or dead tissue. However, they quickly move to healthy tissue to feed, especially in the apical meristem. And, and what happens is dead, damaged, and or deformed new leaves emerge. And in many cases, because the damage was down, was done down inside almost at the apical meristem, the actual apical meristem, you don't see the damage until the new growth is pushed out. And then you see these uh, damaged leaves. So over on the left, you see uh, windmill palm leaf coming up and it's brown and, and damaged in the, in the middle. You see another windmill palm leaf that's dead. And on the right, you see majesty palm leaves. So we have stunted deformed emerging leaves. In many cases, the leaf, leaves can be compressed, zigzag or accordion-like in their growth. And that's because uh, the leaves have been damaged and they're obstructing the natural um, upward movement of new leaves. And so they become compressed and distorted. Sometimes unopened or unevenly opened spear leaves, that means leaves come up, they're like a spear and they don't open normally. Uh, they have dark necrotic areas. They're truncated or cut off or they're, they have missing or deformed pinnae. Now, all of these symptoms can be symptoms also of other problems like compressed zigzag or accordion-like growth can, can be a, a boron deficiency. There are some cases when that growth, when it's coming from a, a sucker at the base of the stem on a multi-stem species, that growth, that's actually normal initially because the new uh, growing point has to break out through, through persistent leaf bases. Unopened or unevenly opened spear leaves can be boron deficiency. Truncated or cut off new leaves can be South American palm weevil. But again, so far that's confined just to San Diego County, although it is marching northward steadily, but slowly, or should I say flying northward. And missing or deformed pinnae can also can be the result of a pink rot disease or South American palm weevil. So here you see some, some examples of these uh, new leaves. This is king palm, and this is in orange along Tustin Avenue. Notice on the, on the right, you have that accordion, deformed accordion type growth. There's some, uh, on the left is king palm. On the right is Kentia palm at LACMA, LA County Museum of Art, just west of downtown LA. And here's the actual king palm that we uh, cut down in orange and West Coast Arborist cut it down and expertly sliced it up for me on site. And then I took the pieces to Paul Santos. And on the right, you see that compressed accordion type growth. You see the necrotic tissue uh, in there. And, and there's probably, there could be pink rot in here too from the damage, the eating damage, the feeding damage that the banana moth was, was doing. Of course, you'd only see that if you took the palm down and, and dissected it. So you're gonna, we're gonna have to use the the outwardly visual symptoms on the left and the other pictures pictures I've shown so far for diagnosis. Uh, th this, unless you want to cut the palm down and sacrifice it. But typically, a, a palm that's as far gone as this one is, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get it to recover if it recovers at all. So here's an example of how fast this can go. This is the same uh, yard in Fullerton, California in Northwestern Orange County. And there you, on the left, you see it in June of 2020. And on the right, you see it a little over a year later in 2021. And you can see how it's gotten much worse in, in what, 15 months or so? It's all king palms. There you see a close-up of some leaves coming out of a majesty palm. And not only are there dead or necrotic areas, you also see a, a big glob of, of uh, frass hanging off that one spear leaf in the center of the photo. So um, 
Some other signs and symptoms include copious, somewhat coarse, sodus-like frass. If the apical meristem is killed, the palm is dead, but lower leaves in the canopy can remain green and normal looking for an extended period. They kind of form a green skirt. And this is exactly like what happens to South American palm weevil. That, that heads for the apical meristem also, kills it, but then you have these a ring of, of uh, green leaves remaining on the tree for quite some time. Damage can leave the apical meristem susceptible to secondary issues like pink rot disease, which, we, which we've uh, touched on already. And as I've also touched on, symptoms, because they appear in the newest leaves, could be mistaken for one of several diseases, disorders, or pests like uh, pink rot, micronutrient deficiencies, heat stress, South American palm weevil, and areified mites. Banana moth also shows up in nursery stock. So if any of you are working in with nurseries on their pest management problems, uh, you it can be here. This is a nursery in Oxnard. And uh, the banana moth larvae chewed out the base of this queen palm in a 15 gallon so that it just fell over. And there, there you see one of the larvae that we extracted from it. And you know, it's all the dead tissue and as you can even see the grainy frass. So how do we manage banana moth? Well, stress weakened and our wounded palms seem more susceptible, especially those that are water stressed. Now that doesn't mean banana moth won't attack perfectly healthy palms, but by keeping our palms in optimal con condition, not only will they be less attractive, but if they do become attacked uh, and we can get them to recover, they'll recover more quickly if they were healthy to begin with. So minimize palm stress and maximize palm health. Water stress and poor nutrition might be important factors. Early detection is critical. Once you see palms that have got, got as far gone as I've shown, they're probably too late to get them to recover. Uh, consider treating freshly cut surfaces with BT the BT product or one of the new, relatively new systemics, because again, those cut surfaces emit a chemical signal that attracts banana moths to them. Uh, consider prophylactic treatments of the leaves and apical meristem with, with BT, with a BT product or one of the new uh, systemics. And you might want to consider root zone treatments with some of those new systemics also so that not only so you can get the, the, the material up inside the palm also. So I want to acknowledge um, Micah Jean from the city of Orange who gave us permission to take down one of their king palms and Chris Burbich from West Coast Arborist and his crew who came out and, and did the uh, takedown for me and the slicing and dicing. And Lyle Buss for the University of Florida who generously shared some very nice photos of banana moth with me. So I, uh, that's my presentation and I think we have questions now. Is that correct, Robin? Uh, yes, we will be doing a Q&A. Okay. So if you want to stop sharing your screen and I'll go ahead and share mine. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so if you have any questions, go ahead and uh, type that into the Q&A box.
might there be questions in the chat box too? Uh, yes, we've been uh, monitoring that. So I got a couple of lists of questions that people ask. Okay. How far north have the banana moth been found? You know, that, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's from San Diego to LA counties for sure. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's in Ventura County, but I, I have not documented it farther north. So, so check those susceptible species, windmill palm, majesty palm, kentia palm, and king palm. That's, that's where I think you'll see it first. And then does Zytec work as a systemic in palms for the moth? Uh, Zytec is a, a midacloprid. Um, you know, we, we haven't done any trials on it. But, but it is systemic in palms, and so it should provide some protection. It should provide some protection. Any other questions? Uh, got a question about South American palm weevil. Uh, okay. list, of, <laughs> list of reproductive host or attack species. Well, the, the, right, right now, the primary host of South America palm weevil is a Canary Island date palm. It loves that palm because it's big, has a lot of leaves, a lot of food for it, and a lot of places to, to uh, lay eggs, deposit eggs. But it's jumped off it, as it's killed more and more Canary Island date palms in San Diego area. It's now jumped off into other species like, like Brahia. Um, other species of, of Phoenix, uh, uh, Jubea chilensis. So, uh, and, and in its native in its native range in in tropical America, it attacks scores of palms. So, I, I think this, the future does not bode well for us with South American palm weevil, unfortunately. And do you know if there's a preference for the South American palm weevil attacking male or female palms? I, I know of no preference. Okay. And then have you seen boars affecting kings or kentia palms? Um, I have one of the attendees asking that they seen trunk damage and goop pouring out of the trunk. Yeah, I, I, have, I have seen boars on Kentia and king palms, and most of mostly the ones I've seen there are the invasive shot hole borer, which I've documented and wrote an article about in Palm Arbor. In fact, uh, Palm Arbor has two articles on the new fusarium wilt and an article on banana moth, and an article on invasive shot hole borer on palms. But uh, Typically, the damage we're seeing on palms is nothing compared to that from, from the fusarium wilt and the banana moth, so far at least. And is there an optimal tool for sanitation method? For, I wonder what the, uh, the first. It sounds like it's going to be regarding fusarium wilt. Fusarium wilt? Um, yeah, what I recommend for saw blades is, is to brush them clean, get all the sawdust and fibers off of them, and then soak them in a 50% solution of household bleach for five minutes before using them on a new palm. And uh, we I also, would, uh, oh, go ahead. You, we can also, you can also heat treat the, the saw with a, a, a torch but um, I, I just found the easiest way is have several saws and, and, and always keep, after you use them, soak, clean them and soak them, and then use a new saw when you, when you go onto a new tree. And I would say if you're going to use a bleach and water solution, um, after you sanitize it, make sure you properly dry the pruning tool. You don't wanna make right. that cut where you're gonna cause that bleach to cause any uh, damage to the vascular tissue. Sure, yeah, so that's a, that's a good point. F, clean, clean, clean them thoroughly and keep, keep, always clean your tools well 
tools well at the end of the day, wipe them clean, oil them if you have to, and uh, th that'll prolong their life. And proper removal of a palm that's been infected with fusarium. Well, <laughs> the, the, the best way to do it is to get a crane and lift it out in one intact piece, wrap it in six mil poly and send it to a landfill. But sometimes you can't get a crane in there. Sometimes it's, a crane is, I mean, a crane's always expensive. So you, you have to cut it into, into sections to remove it and then, and then dig, trench the root ball and remove that. In, in all cases, you want to spread out the six mil poly over the area, put up plywood barriers to catch any thrown or drifting material, and then roll all that stuff up in the six mil poly and take that to the landfill also. That, that's basically the only way you can do it. And any other questions? Looks like that's all the uh, questions we have. Okay. I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you haven't already, you can sign up for our other upcoming webinars on our website at rainbowecoscience.com. We've got a great lineup of other PhD topics and speakers coming up. We hope you'll be able to join us for those. Uh, there is a survey that's gonna follow after this webinar. Please take a couple minutes to fill out. We greatly appreciate your feedback.